So Dahlia, you and I have known each other for a long time. I was kind of thinking yes. we're almost like bookend friends. Like I met you kind of at the beginning of this journey and here I am at this pivotal point in your life. We're reconnecting. Wow. Yeah. So I've known you a long time and I'm trying to think of when we first met. I feel like it might've been like 2008. Yeah. It was a long time ago. Early. It was at least 10 years ago, at least. Yes. At least 10 years. And we know each other because um, my former husband was very good friends with Justin um, and they shared uh, a journey in Iraq separately, but, um, and they met in their civilian jobs of all things. Uh Yes, the Department of Justice. Um, and then we became friends. Um, so uh, it's lovely to have the opportunity to talk to you about Justin. Um, and thank you so much for taking the time. I can't imagine what the last several months have been. How long has it been? How, how long? Uh, uh, almost six months. Almost six months. Okay. So in many ways, it feels like six hours or six years. You I know, can like imagine. <laughs> Time is, you know, a little fluid these days. <laughs> Only imagine. Um, but we wanted to uh, hear more from you um, to complement the story that has been written about Justin for GI Jobs. And so um, I just wanted to share a little bit about our connection and then um, yeah. a few questions. Does that sound okay? That sounds amazing. I'm looking forward. You know, Monique, I remember uh, the first time I met uh, your former husband, it was like they had some party at DOJ and I went to meet Justin. And the first thing he said was, you have to meet Monique. You and Monique are going to love each other. So I just flashed back to that. It was like in a basement or something, somewhere at DOJ. Love it. Well, Arthur was, was and is a huge fan of you and Justin's. And I know that Justin, like for many people, made a huge impact on Arthur's life. Even though we're not married anymore, we are friends. Um, we have this strange, you know, modern family where my husband and him are friends and his wife and I are friends and we've been able to raise our children together and it's lovely. And I know how, how much Justin meant to Arthur. Um, wow. I think, you know, like many people he aided in, in Arthur's recovery from his own um, injury in Iraq. Um, so I just want to say that. They definitely, definitely supported each other. Good. And we're there for each other. I'm glad to hear that. And hello, Kelba. <laughs> yeah, a Rottweiler dub in the picture now. <laughs> totally fine. It's part of life. So um, I just have a couple of questions. And I wanted yeah. to start with, um, you are quoted in the story talking about how important it was to you for people to know what Justin was like just as Justin. And the first question I want to ask is, why is that important to you for people to know the other dimensions of Justin? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Because I actually thought about that afterwards. Like, why am I like so focused on everyone knowing the full? And I think because, you know, people who have this very dynamic public presence, who who win awards, who are involved with, you know, different committees and boards, everyone, you know, celebrates their accolades, which is amazing. And that is wonderful. But I feel like that's just the tip of the iceberg of who he really is. Yeah. And, you know, unfortunately, Monique, you know, you and I, uh, you know, the DC area, we see a lot of people where they have all these amazing kind of, you know, public personas and maybe not the best private relationships or maybe like aren't the yeah. best in pri private lives or aren't kind. And Justin is like, whatever you see in public is like what exists in private with a like extra like helping of silliness, of goofiness, <laughs> of gentleness. And um, he's just this, he's one of the few people in this world that surprise me. And, you know, frankly, with our communications across the veil, continue to surprise me. Yes. So, you know, he's a very rugged, burly kind of Marine, but also just one of the gentlest spirits I've ever met. Um, someone who pays deep attention to, you know, your words, and then quickly tries, you know, to make my dreams come true all the time. Um, you know, his gentleness with kids, with animals, always with people in need, whatever mm -hmm. that is. Um, his creativity, his love of photography and all the amazing photos and photo books he's created. He was learning Canva the last few months because he was excited about how to play with fonts and photographs. He's, you know, speaks three languages and wanted to learn more loved traveling, loved cooking. So he's this embodiment of a Renaissance man. So for me, you know, I want everyone to know the full Justin because of Justin, 
But, you know, also as a military spouse, I think a lot of our service members get painted into this box mm -hmm. of, you know, hyper-masculine, you know, overly analytical, you know, very mission-driven, which none of those are bad mm -hmm. things. But I think, you know, we don't always get to see, like, the full humanity of yep. the service members. And, you know, I feel like Marines get this extra, like, Arr. Absolutely. <laughs> right? Um, you know? As they should. Um, but I just do think it's important to look past, you know, the uniform and the stereotypes and sometimes even caricatures we have and to just see like the full textured humanity behind that. That's that really resonates with me, even though my military connection is different now. It's through my son. But um, that feels like a, a unique message also that came from post 9-11 veterans who you know, I think we know we're, is it different generation in many ways? They were an all volunteer force fighting a war. They, at least for me, what I saw was like, we were like young families, we had children. And when they came back and because so many had such high rates of survival because of the miracle of modern medicine and heroic acts, like what Justin experienced, they come back to life. And the message I kind of remember hearing very consistent with Justin is like, I want to continue to live my life and have purpose and, yeah. and not sort of pause, yeah. um, which I also felt was um, like, I got to peek at your story. Um, I also felt was such an interesting message for the rest of the world too. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the questions I also had was, um, well, it's less of a question, I guess, and more, and then I want to hear more about Justin, and more of a reflection on, um, I, you know, Justin moved from working with veterans, but then also finding real meaning and, and opportunity to support people from, from different walks of life. You talked about um, people who were formerly incarcerated or people who had other kinds of disabilities. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, this is not going to come out perfectly, but maybe why that's important for, in the simplest terms, like the military civilian divide, that I guess what I'm saying is what I've observed is it seems like there's value in um, in the military community connecting on, on different levels with like the civilian community, mm -hmm. things like this, like dealing with setbacks or dealing with disabilities or starting your life in a new way. I don't know. I just wondered if you could reflect on a little bit about that dynamic of why that multidimensional understanding of veterans can be great for connecting with civilian folks who maybe don't really understand the military. That was a very long yeah. question. No, I, I think it's like, I, I love that you asked this because I feel like in, especially in the last like five years, this has been Justin's passion, mm -hmm. you know? And I think it started off when he was researching post-traumatic stress and realized like, Military service, you know, we, we think of, you know, post-traumatic stress and we think military veterans. It's kind of the stereotype. But the vast majority of people who have post-traumatic stress are not veterans. You know, it's car accidents is like one of the number one causes, sexual assaults. You know, sometimes a child growing up in a certain community where they face violence or even in a, you know, very safe community oh. with household violence. Yeah. Hilda's a green, our dog. <laughs> uh, so post-traumatic stress is, you know, part of life and you know Justin got me to say post-traumatic stress and not disorder because it's not a disorder it's a natural response to trauma and mm -hmm. trauma can occur in so many situations so this research that he started doing <laughs> Kelba feels very strongly about this like you know, channeling Justin in some way exactly. yes yes <laughs> um so this kind of got his thinking started on, you know, all these different ways that different groups of people are connected. And he started doing research at the time on people who had been incarcerated and, you know, the similarities of, you know, like the high, you know, cortisol levels, even from the physicality that, you know, always being in like tense and awaiting the next move. And then what happens when you come home yep. from incarceration? What happens when you come home? from war. And even though we think of those as two very different pathways, the, the effects on the nervous system and the soul can be similar. Um, now, at the same time, Justin uh, started connecting with his one of his best buddies and his business partner, uh, Jack Fanous, at Job Paths. And Job Paths worked with veterans and how to support veterans, um, not just in getting a job, but because Jack had come from the nonprofit world and had a nonprofit for veterans, he's like, okay, you know, we get this veteran a job, but it was everything else 
Mm-hmm. That it was housing insecurity. It was food insecurity. It was support with their spouse. It was childcare, especially for a lot of female veterans that was actually getting in the way. You know, all these people were standing up and saying, we have jobs for veterans. Um, but then all these other things would get in the way of actually getting um, a job. So, you know, Jack and Justin were really thinking holistically mm-hmm. about veterans and this idea, you know, thinking really holistically about someone as opposed to just like thinking about you in the this one way, um, started their thinking about people with disabilities. And, you know, and Jack always says, like, all of a sudden, Justin's like, you know what, what about people with disabilities? These are a lot of the same barriers to entry in the workforce. And then um, Justin was doing his um, incarceration in America reading list. And I always call them Justin reading list, because he'll get really interested in a social justice topic, and then just create a research list, yeah. and make a book list for himself, organizations to, you know, look at and read the memos they put out or white pages or things like that. So he was really heavy into that research. So he and Jack really, you know, got together and said, you know, what we're doing for veterans, like what makes veterans different? Mm -hmm. Um, Okay, they've served, you know, and I should say, like, even when I first met Justin, which is 16 years ago, he'd always say, like, being a veteran is one way to serve your country. It is not the only way. Mm -hmm. And when I was a teacher for a long time, he'd come talk at school and he said, you know, teachers serve their country as well. And there's so many other ways that so many professions all around that are in service. So just find your way to serve. So you always felt this idea of service, you know, existed far outside just the military. And um, so, you know, he started looking at the connections of um, that they could make, and they started meeting with a lot of people in different nonprofits. And what they kept seeing over and over again was the same threads, Hmm. the same threads of feeling like an outsider in your community. Mm-hmm. of feeling like you didn't have people around you who understood, of housing becoming difficult to obtain for different reasons. You know, people who have, are formerly incarcerated, for example, aren't eligible for a lot of, you know, uh, government subsidized housing. People with disabilities, a lot of housing is not suitable for where they are. Mm-hmm. Uh, same with jobs. You know, a lot of people were standing up ready to hire veterans, but then you also had people who saw veterans and said, oh, I don't want to deal with someone who might have PTS. I don't want to deal with someone who might need a lot of appointments often. You know, people who are formerly incarcerated have different stereotypes against some people with disabilities. One of the best things that happened is they started meeting with people who were in these nonprofits, both as clients and both as founders. And a lot of times the people who found these things are very personal connections. And they started realizing how much more they had in common. And there's one nonprofit um, that works with people who are formerly incarcerated out in Chicago, where a lot of them, they were already bringing together military members with kids who had just come out of the juvenile system and kids, you know, young people coming out of the adult system to really talk about their similar journeys. And, um, you know, they're both spaces where hypermasculinity is a big deal. Mm -hmm. They're both spaces where you're not supposed to show emotion. You're supposed to just be brave and courageous all the time. They're both places where you come out of them with severe post-traumatic stress sometimes and are very anxious in your community. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, the adrenaline of those places, you come out and you come home and that there's a whole community who doesn't really understand what you've been through. So working with that group really allowed them to start seeing, we can really connect people mm-hmm. um, who would have thought they didn't have any connections, mm-hmm. you know? Um, really well and then you start bridging that military civilian divide which is really important for everybody on the military end takes away that feeling of nobody understands what i've been through which is something we hear over and over the public has no clue what i've been through Mm -hmm. you know the public doesn't understand me they don't know who i am and then on the civilian side to understand these you know people they see on tv in a uniform you know unless you're in a military community kind of like we are here it's just this like thing far away on a battlefield you start to see these are just human beings who, you know, have sensitivities, have needs, have desires, who have a lot in common with you across political lines, across uh, geographic lines. So that was a a really interesting thing. And, you know, that's why, like, you know, I am not like I'm in education and children's book writing, but that's why I'm like really continuing with Justin's path and, you know, with job paths with Jack, because I feel like when he got to that part, this became his life's mission is how do you support people who are in these vulnerable populations, not because the people themselves don't have what it takes or are necessarily vulnerable, but we've created a society where certain people are more vulnerable and at risk for housing, for job, for insecurity in these areas. And it became his, you know, his life's mission. He was just excited. He could work all the time. 
And, um, you know, Jack and I always laugh that Justin will send us these messages, you know. So when Jack's having a meeting and he starts like, you know, just goofing off reading a magazine or something, his lights will start flashing. And he's like, I know that's Justin. Like, you guys have to continue this work. You have to continue right. what we're doing. <laughs> I love it. I love hearing you talk about Justin. And I love that I. it sounds like almost he was just getting started. And you yeah. are continuing that. And it feels like such an important thing, especially now in the country that we find things that we have in common and ways we can yeah. support one another. I also feel like I've given, you've gotten to talk a lot about Justin's work and we also want to hear more about his life. So yeah. um, I will say that I was, I was just uh, enraptured with your story at oh. his um, memorial service at the army, army, Navy country club. Yeah. Army, Navy country club. Um, I loved your love story. And so could you tell us a story, another story about Justin? Um, I don't know, one that stands out and you don't have to use this one, but I, didn't he take you on yeah. adventures and he'd look for adventures for you? Or like, yeah. I don't know, just th these little stories about Justin, this person we've known for a long, I was like, oh my God, there's all these things we don't know about this incredible man who, you're right, is a Renaissance man. So please tell us more about Justin. I swear I hear him right now saying, don't get too sappy if this is going public. <laughs> well, they shouldn't have asked me to talk to you then because <laughs> this is what you're getting. <laughs> tell me more. <laughs> You know, one of the um, the va the shared values Justin and I have is our love of exploration. And, you know, we, we both, I mean, we met in Argentina in a Spanish class, so kind of lends itself to this adventurous life. But, you know, one of my favorite things is he would plan these adventures for us locally. And when we lived in Manhattan, especially because, you know, we I hadn't lived in Manhattan in 20 years. He'd never lived there. Or like, there's, you know, you really, there's no excuse to get bored in New York. But... <laughs> You know, we would take um, turns kind of planning a date for the other one, an adventure. And he would always make these little itineraries, you know, like originally with like clip art from Word and print them out. He hadn't gotten like, to Canva yet. <laughs> he hadn't gotten to Canva yet. So it's like till 2015. And, um, you know, he would, and it would just be a way to get to know the city. But, you know, the, the most important thing is, it is an amazing oh. gift and privilege to feel so understood mm -hmm. by another person. And that's something a lot of people got to spend time with Justin. You know, I, I got it as, as like a soulmate relationship, but Jack, his business partner, you know, we always joke that Jack would just bring up an idea and Justin's like, okay, I've already posted about it. It's done. And Jack's like, what? <laughs> but, you know, Justin would um, like, one of the things is like, I, like, I was like, I really miss nature, you know, living in the city. So we like took the train to Sleepy Hollow and we walked around these parks and it was Halloween time and we got to go to these like, you know, graveyards and cool old houses. And um, and it was just fall leaves everywhere. Uh, we went to a place called the Elevated Acre, which is just like, you walk up some steps randomly in lower Manhattan and you go up and there's just like an acre of gorgeous like parkland that overlooks the river. Oh, we need to know um, where this is. <laughs> You know, so he would just find like the coolest mm. small tiny museums or, you know, took me to a flamenco show because that was one of the first shows we saw in Argentina. And he found this random flamenco show. I mean, even when we were traveling, like in Italy, Justin would just say, let's walk down this way. And he has a tendency to love like alleyways. I'm like, uh, yeah, that's a guy. I don't, I'm not going to walk down a random alleyway. He's like, I'm with you. <laughs> but we'd go down this creepy little alley and all of a sudden there'd be like a theater who was doing a play in English about the history of Florence. <laughs> and like and starting in 10 minutes right yeah sign us up so he just had this like magnetism for adventure like I feel like adventure found him but he also had like that beautiful analytical lawyer mind that would just go online find something for me like it looked like it took him 10 minutes but he would have this whole itinerary and it was always just the right right thing mm -hmm. um um a few months um before his transition he planned you know we were like looking at maybe moving to the country part of the year and um, just having like kind of quiet idyllic and you know things were a little hectic health-wise at that point and mm -hmm. you know I was doing the driving and a lot of the heavy lifting but he went online and booked us a place called the manor house and he said I want to see you as lady of the manor <laughs> and it was this beautiful like you know older like I think it's a Georgian home just like way too many bedrooms for us and the dog but just that had this beautiful view and he said I, I just really want you to have this you know and just like 
the impeccability of, he goes, this room has a four poster bed, this, there's a little tea nook, you know, it was his attention to detail yeah. that just, you know, th just the most romantic person I've ever met um, that, you know, did that. So yeah, yeah. I have like a million more of these I could share, but he we'll always plans the perfect adventures. You do weekly stories with Dahlia and hear yes. about, about <laughs> dates and hopefully partners are taking notes on them. <laughs> so, so Justin continues to inspire people in different ways. Um, and yeah. <laughs> do that. Well, um, is there anything else you want to share, Dahlia? Um, yeah, you know, what I would love to say, um, like to anyone listening is, you know, love is eternal. I have a very different understanding of what happens now when someone transitions. It's something I never thought about, you know, as much as I do now, but love is eternal and our connection with those we love does mm -hmm. not go away um, at all. Like they just find very different creative ways of communicating with us. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty amazing and wonderful. Um, but also like Justin really hated people who gave speeches about things and then didn't <laughs> do that. And okay. we see this in every, every area of service, uh, you know, for any group of people, right? I, we are most familiar with wounded warriors, but people get up and give these wonderful speeches and then that's it. Uh, so I'm encouraging everyone out there to really look out in your community. Like think about the big things in your community, look at the small things in your community and just think, how can I be of service? How mm -hmm. can I support? And again, like if you had told me a year ago, I'd be working with Jack and Pete and job paths and meeting clients about setting up, you know, these websites for them, for veterans or people with disabilities um, to think about what their needs are, what, if they need counseling and a job, uh, I would have been like, yeah, no, that's, that's Justin's thing. But his mission is so important. And it was, it was his life's passion to really support people. And this gave him the avenue to um, do it. So here I am, like mm -hmm. doing that along with my stuff, um, because, you know, we're interconnected souls. He's always with me when I write. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I'm going to keep the earthly part of this project going. Um, but just for everybody to to think about, especially in this moment in time when we whatever news station you're watching, you're getting angry watching it, <laughs> because that <laughs> seems to be um, is to just look at those issues and um, instead of just being upset and listening to all the pundits talking and the reporters talking just think what's one small thing I can do today about that issue and just to go out and do it what a lovely continued message of of selflessness and service um so thank you so much for the time and we can't wait to see what continues and how Justin's work continues and what you continue to do Dahlia you are also obviously a force in your own right. And he knew that <laughs> he picked a partner who could uh, probably keep up and maybe outpace him in many ways. Um, so thank you. I do have that thought when I get panicked or sad or, you know, I just think like, okay, you know, I, I did not sign up for an ordinary life with an extraordinary man. <laughs> so can't have extraordinary man and just an ordinary life. So we'll see what this relationship, what the next phase is like. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Monique. <laughs>